Welcome. I'm Doug Temkin. They're taken, so. Uh, this is the Wild Series, Writers on Writing. And uh, we bring uh, various writers here to talk about their writing process. Not so much the content of what they're writing, but how they, how they go about writing. Uh, so today we have uh, Hilton uh, Obenzinger with us from uh, Stanford University. And uh, the rest of my introduction is going to take up reading his uh, titles. It takes quite a while here. He's the, or was, he's a retired associate director of the Honors and Advanced Writing Program at Stanford. He's associate director of the Hume Writing Center at Stanford. And he's now a lecturer in English and American Studies and Honors Writing uh, at Stanford. In addition to that, these are his books, uh, which you're welcome afterward to come up and take a look at and uh, talk with him as well. We'll go from now until near noon. I know you have to be out of here by, uh, by 12.15, some of you for other classes and so on. So we'll go till near noon and leave uh, some time for question and answer so you can uh, ask what, what you're interested in. And then, as I say, feel free to come up and uh, look at the books and talk to Hilton some more. So I'll just uh, let Hilton come up and, uh, and talk here. So if you give him a greeting, that'd be great. These books are for sale, too. <laughs> All $10 each, a bargain. Um, thanks a whole lot. I really appreciate being here. And I've never been to this campus. It's really beautiful. I don't know how you can study. <laughs> well, maybe you don't. <laughs> but no, you get your work done. Um, one of the things that I do is that I, I hold a series of uh, conversations with uh, writers like what uh, Doug described here, uh, mostly writers at Stanford, because every place, like a university or a college, is a writing community. Everybody has to write, uh, even if you're a mathematician, uh, a physicist, you know, historian. You're always writing, whether it's a grant proposal or a history book, whatever it might be. Uh, and I've been doing this for nine, going on 10 years uh, with 50 or 60 writers now. Uh, some of them are on uh, iTunes, Stanford on iTunes. And uh, there's a website that, uh, uh, if you're interested, you can contact uh, Doug and find out uh, you know, how to click on. It's fairly, it's very direct, very easy. Uh, but the idea is that there is a writing community. And a lot of times when I ask professors, well, let's have a conversation about writing, uh, how you write. And let's say political scientist or historian, I said, well, I never even thought about it before. Uh, so kind of self-awareness about writing uh, is something that does not necessarily come automatically to people. Uh, and the fact that there are different kinds of approaches and skills uh, that people develop and bring with them. What I discovered is that every one of these people um, are very idiosyncratic. They all have different ways of working, all have different ways of, of overcoming writer's block uh, or whatever it might be. Uh, but it was striking uh, to see all those differences. Working with students, I discovered there were a lot of differences. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the woman who likes to uh, write with a cowboy hat on, makes her feel good. The guy who's in, in the military likes to wear his uniform because he's at work. Uh, um, someone who likes to write only in their pajamas in their room. Uh, of course, nowadays, some of the students go out in their pajamas. But, uh, uh, but uh, you know, just that alone, the different ways that uh, uh, people work, the environments that they create, uh, is really fascinating. The one that was always the strangest uh, that I is the, uh, uh, always give was, and there turned out to be two students in the course of the last 15 or so years who have done this, the, the woman who would wear her high school prom dress in order to write. Um, and when she told me this in a workshop, I, I didn't know what to say. Uh, then I thought about it afterwards that, you know, she f wants to feel special in writing. Uh, writing is a performance. You, you know, there's you, who you are, in various different forms. 
and there's the you who you think you are when you're writing. Uh, you kind of have an image of yourself, just like you have an image of your imaginary readers. You know, and a lot of t times people imagine themselves as having, you know, uh, you know, corduroy jacket with elbow patches, and be, you know, uh, you know that kind of image of themselves. Uh, so she wanted to have that. Uh, I feel good about myself. Uh, the fact that she's writing uh, in her senior year and she can still fit in her progress is probably another good reason to make her feel good. So um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my own writing and how I uh, uh, became a writer. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the insights uh, from uh, teaching, but uh, talking uh, through this How I Write program. By the way, there is a, one that's coming up uh, May 4th with uh, Abraham Verghese, uh, who is a doctor. Uh, in the medical school, but he's also written uh, memoirs and a best-selling novel, um, Cutting from Stone, I think is the name of it, uh, and uh, a really interesting writer, the idea of a, of a doctor who becomes a writer. There have been others, Chekhov for one, and uh, William Carlos Williams in American literature. It's happened before, but uh, so he has an interesting, I think, perspective on how he uh, goes about doing his writing. Um, I come from you know, an immigrant family, and uh, I think I got some kind of bug in my head. Uh, in seventh grade, I had a crush on a, on a girl in the class, um, and uh, the bug was to do, you know, you've seen uh, Napoleon Dynamite, right? And uh, most of you have. And uh, Pedro, right? He makes a cake, and, right? That whole uh, thing for, uh, you know, to give uh, to, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the girl he's paying attention to, right? So I had a similar type of uh, approach. I, I took the class picture and made a, a, a drawing of her. Uh, uh, I bought flowers. But the main thing is that I wrote a long poem. Uh, you know, the most beautiful girl, an angel came to tell me who the most beautiful girl in the world was, and her lips are like cherries, et cetera. Really bad. Um, and. Uh, I, I have a couple of sheets of the draft still, and every once in a while I look at it in order to see how far I've come <laughs> or degenerated. But uh, uh, so I wrote it up nice and neat, um, and uh, I knocked on the door and gave it all to her. And, okay, so the uh, it, uh, the next day in school, uh, she was showing the poem to her friends, and everyone was giggling, uh, and I was just completely humiliated. But on top of that, it didn't work. Um, uh, now, 30 plus years later, she came to a book event I did in New York, which was quite amazing. And if she said, you know, you got four kids, I got two kids, let's run away together, I would have. But, uh, <laughs> but it's too late. So, uh, but, so what's interesting about that isn't so much that, is that after I did that and had that completely humiliating experience, you can imagine seventh grade, um, the boys in the class thought there was something uh, interesting and cool. Uh, and so they asked me to write love letters for them. You know, your, uh, your eyes are like staircases to the moon, whatever. And, and, um, and I did, 25 cents a letter. Now, 800 years ago, that was worth money. Um, uh, you know, so, and I got, oh, okay, and I kept on writing these letters for them, love letters, that were terrible, uh, you know, uh, and, but they, they, they it, it did the job, whatever the job was, I mean, it, you know, it, it worked. But I felt encouraged that this could be an interesting thing to do, to write. I got reinforcement. Um, and then, you know, through, um, uh, in school, I got reinforcement from teachers saying, oh, you know, this is good, keep going. And that kind of reinforcement, reinforcement from readers, reinforcement you know, uh, from other writers, is the kind of thing that, uh, for every field, but certainly for writing, you really need that. Because writing is a social thing. Um, I imagine everything, every field of knowledge is a social thing. Uh, in some way or another, but writing, even, even if you're alone, 
Uh, and you never see anyone, language is created through social interaction. Uh, uh, you know, even when you saw that little YouTube clip of the twins uh, jabbering at each other as little babies, uh, you know, they had developed the language with each other. Uh, so it, it's a, a, a constantly um, looping process of, of getting feedback and then writing, getting, even when something is done. Um, and a lot of times, uh, uh, for, for writing projects, uh, uh, things are not finished. They just reach a stage where you let it go, uh, where it's good enough. Uh, and thank God for copy editors and, and all of that. So uh, I went to college and uh, wanted to be a writer. Uh, and fortunately, I went to college in New York where there was, uh, and I could kind of, part and grew up in New York, so I was participating in the writing scene there. Uh, and writing poetry and fiction. Uh, uh, and then after I graduated uh, with a group of friends, we wanted to get at the root, the whole process of writing uh, from the bottom up. Uh, and that meant at that time um, uh, learning how to operate a printing press. Uh, today, I think if you wanted to do something like that, it might be learning how to develop a website. Uh, you still have to write on the website, but uh, so much uh, production. Or writing a book that would be an e-book today. You, so the printing process is not the limiting um, factor that it was once. Uh, so I went to community college uh, and uh, uh, to the printing, you know, graphic arts program, learned how to operate a printing press. We had a printing press in the Mission District. Uh, it was a community service project. We printed for the farm workers or, uh, you know, uh, people uh, uh, protesting the Marcos dictatorship of the Philippines, whatever it might be, different uh, uh, concerns in the community. And we also published uh, uh, literary books. So one of my books, I had already published uh, books, but I managed to print a book, you know, that was from bottom up, including uh, the distribution. Well, it's a pretty, it's a very time-consuming thing, all of those aspects of writing a book. Um, but uh, after a while, I got, uh, uh, after around eight years of uh, working that way, uh, the chemicals started to get to me. And I said, yeah, I think I'll try something else. All the time doing my own writing. And um, so I went to, to get a master's degree and. Uh, uh, San Francisco State uh, on um, uh, educational technology so that I could end up writing for educational TV and writing um, training programs, various different uh, aspects of uh, things that needed to be done ed in an educational way, especially for industry uh, and uh, business. And so, and then I began also writing other things. So. I uh, worked for a company that, for example, did oral histories of communities and corporations. So now the difference between that and academic history is that when somebody you record says some kind of really horrible racist remark, they get the opportunity to cross it off. Um, uh, you know, rather than, well, we've got, we, we've got what you said as part of this history. Uh, so a corporation will you know, want to put things in the right direction as far as they're concerned. Um, so after doing this for a, a long time, one of the things that you do, even when I, I worked at the College of San Mateo in their electronics uh, department, I was absurdly, uh, briefly, uh, uh, assistant professor of electronics, not knowing anything about electronics. Um, and because they were doing interactive video training programs, you know, for Apple, for all kinds of people on digital electronics and um, microwave electronics, and I was writing up uh, the scripts for this and developing uh, these programs. And then working uh, uh, as a freelancer, which I did for a long time, working for different consulting firms, you get these incredible uh, deadlines. You all have to deal with deadlines. Uh, everyone in school has to deal with deadlines. But when you're working freelance as a writer, you take every job that comes to you, okay? Because who knows? You know, a month from now there may be nothing. 
So you take every job that comes to you. They may all have the same deadline, but you bank on the fact that someone's going to screw up. And you say, well, look, I can't do it. You didn't give me the information. It's going to have to be two weeks later. Okay? Uh, and, uh, but still, it's very grueling because the, the God forbid those times that actually there are two deadlines at the same time. And you have to actually work on one deadline is hard enough. Um, so I, I began to get worn down from that. And I ended up uh, um, actually going back to San Francisco State so I could teach at a community college because I figured I could teach people how to write. Um, and they can do it themselves. I don't have to do it for them. Uh, and uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, at Stanford teaching writing um, and with a, a doctoral, you know, entering doctoral program there, a very kind of small program, modern thought and literature. And from that, because I wanted to write a book, uh, which I did, um, and continue that kind of scholarly writing along with all the other writing that I had been doing. Uh, and all the books that I've worked on, I don't have, I don't know all, I don't have them all here. Um, they all come from something, from something I wanted to say, not from, gee, I think I'd like to write a book. It's because something pisses me off or I get intrigued. One of the books which I don't have here is that I got a, a, co a commercial job to write the history of the New York Fire Department. This is like 20 years before 9-11. Uh, when actually the office of the fire department was right around the World Trade Center. And uh, I got access to their archives, photos, and I did a yearbook, you know, like a college or high school yearbook with photos of all the, and uh, the, uh, uh, I was fascinated by the research and fascinated with all these different fires and what they mean. Um, and uh, I, uh, well, I completed the job, and almost simultaneously, the president of the union for whom uh, it was contracted lost the election because of some funny money thing, typical New York City <laughs> and politics. And the company I was working for went bankrupt. Um, so I got paid, but I was pissed. Because after, after the New York Fire Department was the Chicago Police Department, and after that was the Sanitation Department. You know, it was like I had a whole career marked out in terms of doing the histories of the universe, uh, according to different public uh, service agencies and corporations too. Well, in any case, um, uh, that kind of motivated me, plus my fascination with what New York City uh, meant and how New York City burns down and rebuilds and burns down, like any city. Um, so, you know, that's the thing that kind of motivated me. God damn it, I'm going to get my own book out of this. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, how I've continued writing many different kinds of writing, scholarly writing, uh, fiction, et cetera. And this, my latest book is called Busy Dying, take off from Bob Dylan's uh, line, he not busy being born, busy dying. And this is a fictional memoir. Uh, you know, or, or autobiographical fiction. Um, and uh, I decided to do it that way rather than call it a memoir because I felt uh, more at ease in telling the truth by saying it was fiction. And also some people complained that they didn't want their names or they wanted things to be changed in the book. And I was writing about when I was a student at Columbia University in 1968, 69, when there was huge student rebellion and the students took over and occupied the university for a week and working with students today um, and uh, kind of uh, the different experiences that people, people had. And that was a need, several things in that book. I wanted to tell that story about what happened in 1968. I wanted to tell the story uh, about the death of my brother and some friends uh, in the book. And I felt like I had to write this book. Um, so, you know, so that's uh, broadly the, uh, the arc of the uh, kind of work that I've done as a writer. And all along the way, of course, I'm stealing stuff, uh, you know, like the New York history, New York fire history, uh, history of corporations. Uh, I've got great material, which we, I will sneak in and fictionalize it somewhat so I don't get sued. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, in teaching uh, uh, and working and talking with writers, uh, professors, I, you know, as I said, there are all these different ways that people work. Um, and uh, starting right off, uh, the first person that I talked in the series uh, with is uh, 
professor of history, French history, named uh, Mary Lou Roberts. She's now in University of Wisconsin. Um, and uh, she you know, described uh, part of her process. I thought that was interesting. Uh, I saw this painting a long time ago at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and thought, this is my writing process. It was five panels. The, third, the, the first was incredibly blurry. The second panel was a little clearer. The third was a little clearer. The fourth was crystal clear. The fifth has started to fade a little bit. So, you know, it's like if you go too far. To me, it feels like I always know what I want to say instinctively because when you research, you make choices. You read some things and not others. I tell my graduate students, don't think. Just go on instinct because I think it's a very underrated human resource. So I have an incredibly vague idea. And then when I begin to write, slowly it becomes more clear. Now, for her process, what that means is that um, she writes a lot. The writing doesn't come in a difficult way. For some people, they have to agonize over it. She would write 85 pages before she figured out really what she wanted to say, what she wanted to write. She wouldn't throw out those pages. She would file them away uh, and maybe use some of it. But uh, people in the audience gasped, those people who can't picture the idea of writing 85 pages and then putting it aside. Um, so that was one way of, of approaching writing. Uh, to have, and people do this all the time, you know, free writing, uh, you know, get your uh, 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 juices going in one way or another, uh, you know, and, and a, lot, a lot of people do that, but not necessarily to the extent that she does. Uh, kind of on the very extreme opposite was the second person I talked to, David Abernathy, who is a political science professor, um, who wrote uh, and published a few years ago a gigantic book on the history of European colonialism from its beginnings and all around the world, trying to ask the question and answer the question, why did Europe do this and the Chinese didn't? Uh, because the Chinese at a certain point were moving in that direction in the, you know, 500 years ago, and then moved back. Um, so uh, he would do research and write notes all the time. He was always writing, but he would write notes about the research and, and making up arguments. But as a political scientist who liked to have models and theories, he wasn't going to write until he figured out what his theory was. So uh, consequently, uh, he wrote mostly during the summer, did his research and wrote during the summer and during the year he was teaching. Uh, it took him 15 years to write that book. Uh, you know, because he wanted to do everything and figure it out first. Again, he was writing, but not the official book. And then he wrote the book, um, and uh, then it was gigantic at that point, and the publisher said, okay, you gotta cut it by at least a third. And he spent another three years cutting the book. I, I said to him, you know, I can offer you some, some techniques, whatever, so it's to speed it up. He says, no, that's the way he does it. That's, again, the idiosyncratic part of this. Um, uh, he didn't publish a lot, but when he did, this is the way that he did it. So uh, those are two extreme examples. I'm going to start with that. a little bit more time. Then, you know, in talking about you know, how people learn how to write and their approach to writing, um, it, it was uh, uh, very interesting to see you know, all the differences there. Not everybody comes from a family of professors and automatically knows how to write. Uh, Ramon Saldivar, who was in the English department, uh, there was only two books in his house in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, uh, one was the Bible, and as a good Catholic family, they never read it because you know the priest will read it or you know it will happen in church, but they had it. And the other one was a book on plumbing. Because uh, his father, who was not a plumber, he figured wanted to be a plumber. Then one day, as a kid, like eight or ten years old, he came home, and in the middle of the living room was a stack of white bound books. And it was an encyclopedia. Uh, and he just imagined this encyclopedia salesman going door to door and somehow convincing his mother. Uh, and he read that book from 
books from cover to cover. And reading got him into wanting to write uh, and, in fact, to read more. So that's another uh, you know, kind of a way that people write. Uh, uh, Leonard Susskind uh, is a physicist, one of the fathers of string theory. He prefers to be the father of his kids, but you know, they call him you know, the father of string theory. Uh, he, came from, he was a plumber. He came from a working class background in the South Bronx. He was, uh, was going to uh, um, City College and he was really into you know, physics and stuff. And one of his physics professors said, I'm going to bring you to a physicist in Princeton. And maybe we're going to get you to study with him. That was great. So he got dressed up the way he thought he should in a proper you know, working class manner. He put on clean overalls. Uh, clean watch cap, nice boots. And he came in and the professor you know, knocked on the door and says, no, you've got to change. Uh, so you know, and he made, met this professor. He ended up not studying with him, but it did inspire him. But he was always a terrible writer. He was in the remedial writing classes until, and, oh, well, still, but someone gave him a book. Okay? Um, and I forgot which one. I know someone gave him Huckleberry Finn. Some of, you know, people have said, wow, this is a great, this is a terrific book. And that got him into, into uh, uh, reading. And that eventually got him into writing. And he, he can write any kind of journal article on physics that will be incomprehensible to maybe all of us here. But what he likes to do is to write books that explains physics so that other people can understand. And he's been very successful at that. Um, and even so, when he gives one example, he was a long time ago, he was invited to write an article for Scientific American, and at least that time they had kind of like a style, which was the first three or four paragraphs, you can do it any way you want, but after that you've got to get so technical that no one else can understand it. Um, and, uh, and, and I remember that. I think Scientific American has loosened up a little bit uh, uh, since then, because I would read it and I would get stuck around the fourth paragraph. But, uh, he didn't want to do that. So I wrote an article explaining things, breaking it down. And uh, they sent it back to him saying, no, you have to write, revise it according to the style. And then he wrote, this is before computers going back and forth, he wrote on top of it and sent it back to him, you touch on my words, I bust in your face. <laughs> <laughs> and so they ended up publishing it. And it won an award for science writing and all this sort of thing. So he was uh, vindicated. Um, so many different ways that people learn how to write. Um, but you know, one of the things that, that was uh, interesting was finding out what happens when people get stuck, uh, when they get writer's block. Then uh, uh, in talking with Richard Rorty, who is a philosopher, political thinker, passed away, I asked him, do you ever get writer's block? Uh, he says, yeah, so get stuck or walk around the block. Well, do you ever really, really get stuck? And he thought for a minute, it was very deadpan delivery. And so, yeah, yeah. the first uh, 10 years after uh, my PhD uh, was very tough. But then I got a divorce. <laughs> and then pause and remarry. So, uh, I, you know, married somebody else. So I didn't follow through with that, you know. Why did that change? But uh, I could imagine. But what it meant to me was that the reason why people get stuck a lot of times doesn't have anything to do with writing. Uh, most of the time, it's not because of writing. Uh, it's because of something outside in your life is intervening in your process. So that's what was going on in his mind. What that something else can be can vary. Uh, Paula Moya, who teaches in the English department, um, uh, she was writing up her dissertation and she, at the university where she was doing it, and her next door neighbor over the fence was someone in another department, uh, a professor in another department, and he was interested in uh, uh, what she was doing and uh, said, uh, well, let me read your dissertation. Um, so, so he read it and he said, well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's good, but uh, the English department is not going to take it. It's, it's, it's too clear. <laughs> uh, which is, in some departments, that actually is a problem. But I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. 
uh, well, this paralyzed her. You know, my God, what am I going to do about this? I said, well, I'll show you. Come on over. Okay. And then he came over to her house to, to work on it, and she picked up that he was actually hitting on her, right? Um, and, and she called up her friend. I don't think this guy is really interested in my dissertation. Needs. Well, no, he's, in any case, he ended up hitting on somebody else, so it became obvious this guy, you know, this was his routine, come up, let me show you my etchings type thing. Um, and it was like, oh, I'll help you with your dissertation. <laughs> the, the, what's interesting about this is, uh, okay, you find out that that's what it is, but she remained paralyzed because he injected this doubt into her head. Very easy, uh, particularly in terms of gender, and she's uh, Chicana, you know, race dynamics to think, oh, I'm not good enough. Uh, what am I doing here? I'm an imposter. Uh, so, uh, so she would, uh, uh, it took a long time to overcome that. Uh, so it, it's, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, even uh, similar to that, but a little bit different, is uh, Terry Root, who is a, uh, a biologist, uh, an environmentalist, does the atlas of birds <coughs> around the world. Um, you know, uh, very productive. She um, was always terrible, always a terrible writer. Her, uh, in kindergarten, they gave her an IQ test, and her teacher said, you know, well, she's retarded. You have to put her in a special class. And her mother, her parents fought all the time for her, but always a very slow writer, always very difficult. And finally, when she wrote her master's thesis, uh, and she showed it to her advisor and said, uh, uh, or to a professor she was working with, said, well, what do you think of the thesis? And he said, I'll tell you what I think of it. And he dropped it into the waste paper basket, OK? Uh, you know, uh, I think if it was a guy, he probably wouldn't have done that. Uh, but it was incredibly insulting. Uh, even if it was a terrible thesis, you don't do something like that. Uh, and she kept on going anyway. And then at the age of 40, and she's uh, in her 60s now, she discovered she was dyslexic. And all the time that she was having a hard time writing, it was because she was dyslexic. And once she found out, it wasn't as if writing got wonderfully easy, but she was able to learn techniques, not taking her hand, writing on paper, but not lifting her hand off so that she doesn't start getting everything floating around uh, in terms of her vision, things of that sort. Uh, and someone in the audience was a scientist who knew about dyslexia and explained how people with dyslexia have a difficulty with uh, small patterns, but have an added ability in terms of large patterns. And as an environmentalist, uh, ecolo you know, studying ecology, most people do it like a square mile or an air a small area at a time, and she does continents. So she was able to understand her ability. Uh, so that was another kind of uh, writer's block um, uh, in overcoming it. Uh, another writer's block is uh, uh, when you feel responsible to other people. And they are, at least in your imagination, over your shoulder watching everything that you do. Um, and they're going to read this. It could be the professor is going to read it. It's going to be, I'm writing for this community project, and will they like it? Uh, any number of, of different things that way. Um, Paula Ibron, who is an uh, anthropologist, was writing about griots, uh, the people in West Africa who uh, you know, tell stories, sing songs. Uh, they're like community leaders. They're all like shaman. Um, and uh, they're very powerful. Uh, and if they say something about you, curse you, or say, don't work with her, she's not good, you're ruined in terms of the community there. And as an anthropologist, she wanted to stay on good terms. So she was always writing with the sense that behind her, this griot was looking over her shoulder. I thought, is this right? Is this right? Is there? It paralyzed her. It made it very difficult. It took a long time for her to work because she was constantly worried about it until you know, 
she tried to separate the worry, write what she wanted to write, and then figure out if it was appropriate or not. She wasn't saying bad things about these guys, but um, then um, just a, a couple of more examples. Um, doing research and the process of doing research. One of the things that uh, people do uh, is to write, and I'll give you some of these techniques, just quick technique. One is whatever project you're working on, give yourself a five minute deadline and quickly on a laptop or a piece of paper, write out your argument. Whatever it is that your argument is or the main theme that you're working on. Push yourself to do it as quickly as possible. I've offered my students to hold a gun to their head, um, you know, if that'll encourage the process. Uh, don't think about it. And as part of that, don't explain anything. In other words, you don't have to describe uh, what the sociological process that you're working on is about. Just talk about what it is that you're going to argue. I've done that many times with students, and I've learned this from a professor who's done this every step of the way of a project. Because you change the way you think, and you don't necessarily realize it. You don't articulate it until you force yourself to articulate it. Then another thing to do after you've kind of worked on that and got a clear sense of your argument, somewhere down the line, do the same five minute exercise, but write a counter argument. How would somebody argue against you? There might be 15 ways to argue against you, but what do you think is the best shot at arguing uh, against you. Uh, whether it's like, well, this is all very well and good, but your methodology sucks, so here and here's why. Uh, or you're wrong this way and that. Uh, and to discover, that helps you sharpen your argument, but it also uh, you know, clarifies, but you're also able to anticipate what people would be doing to argue against you. Uh, and you can... Uh, uh, kind of co-opt them, you know, anticipate the arguments and try and address them ahead of time. So, you know, that would be uh, uh, one way. There are professors uh, that I've talked with who, who write constantly against themselves in order to figure out what they're doing. Um, and, you know, the, the, the research techniques, et cetera, uh, could be very uh, difficult. Now, Terry Carl uh, teaches in the uh, political science department. She was the head of Latin American studies for a long time. And um, she was in El Salvador. She actually ended up playing a role in, in negotiations for uh, uh, achieving peace in the uh, Civil War in El Salvador. She was there at the beginning of the Civil War. And she was trying to figure out what was going on. It was a time when she would walk out of the hotel and in the parking lot, there would be a dead body. Um, uh, you know, someone from the death squads uh, uh, knocked off. So it was a scary time. Everybody around the world except the US, which had a Cold War framework, but all other people who were actually involved in knowing what was going on there had a, a framework that this was a, a typical oligarchy versus peasantry uh, uh, conflict. That was the main thing going on. And that was the framework, like a political, political scientist, that was the model, the framework that she was working on. She met with Roberto Dobison, who was the head of the far right party and actually the head of the death squads, who was uh, ultimately uh, responsible for the assassination of the Archbishop, Archbishop Romero. So this is not a fun guy. Um, uh, a deadly guy, but he was running for president as part of this thing, so she met with him, talked with him, and said to him, this is an oligarchy versus peasantry thing, what are you doing? And he says, no, it's not. Come with me on my uh, election campaign. And so she spent two weeks traveling with him, and what she noticed is that there was always a contingent of peasants who came to the uh, rallies who were not forced or were not paid, there was a contingent that supported his politics, that it was not as simple as she thought. Uh, there was something else going on. Um, Afterwards, she thought, it's not a wise way to do research by challenging the head of the death squads. 
that could have been disastrous. But this thing of actually going out and countering your thoughts, countering your assumptions, uh, once you have it established, uh, that's what you do, is, is something that um, is very powerful. It was a very powerful demonstration of doing that, being forcibly, in some respects, shown that there was something else going on than uh, what all of your assumptions uh, may be. Well, you know, do we have a little bit of time? Let me, let me stop here so that uh, I want to get your questions about writing and anything that I've said. I can blah blah for a long time, but I'd rather hear you a little bit. Yeah. I have no problem writing. I just have a problem thinking of main points after your thesis. Kind of main points. Uh, uh, what is it again? Main. I didn't hear it. I have no problem like writing. I can write, but when I think of my main point and then getting like um, just the body paragraphs after that. But how do you kind of stay on topic and organize? How, how, how to support yeah. what you're doing? Yeah. yeah uh, well, you know, a lot of times people outline ahead of time. And one of the things that I've discovered is that when you're actually writing a lot, some people can't stand outlining. It irritates them. Uh, uh, and other people must. One way, uh, uh, one professor, several professors have done this is to outline, and to outline in such detail that the outline grows and grows and grows so that the outline kind of morphs into the essay, right? So uh, I can't do that. That would drive me up the wall. Um, uh, but I could see how someone could do that, OK? That means that he's kind of structured out his argument and support already. Um, another thing that I've suggested a lot of times, particularly if you're writing something long, but even if not, is to do an outline after you've written it. Paragraph by paragraph. What was this about? What was this about? What was this about? And if you're writing something that may be 10 pages long, you might find out that you said something in page three that you're repeating in page seven. Why am I doing that? And maybe I can streamline it some. Uh, so that, that, that's you know another way. The other thing, though, is that if you it's always best to just keep writing and then looking at it and say, well, this is off. So the question is, why is it off? You know, a lot of times when I work with students and they're writing a paper and, uh, or a thesis, they have footnotes. And uh, actually, Mary Lou Roberts uh, uh, did this a lot. And the footnotes get bigger and bigger. Not documentation footnotes, but comment. You know, it's like all the gossip is in the footnotes. A lot of times you want to read a book, look at the footnotes to see what kind of, uh, you know, who they hate. You know, well, this scholar says this and this, but he's full of it. So, uh, uh, you know, all, all those sorts of things that, and then what you realize at a certain point, and several people, is that the footnote is actually the book. The footnotes should be in the body. If they're that, if I'm getting pulled in that direction, Maybe there's something else going on. It's that thing of like checking yourself about what is my argument, right? So that's a possibility. Um, another one might be that, of course, what are the arguments or facts or whatever it is uh, you know, that support your argument? What do you have there? And is that weak or is that strong, you know, uh, strong enough? Because you may think you, you do have an argument, you do have something that you want to say, but you have to question what is that based on? So that could be another way of, of, of doing that. Uh, another thing that I suggest for students to do um, is to write the ending first. As a, this is all part of revision, because you're going to revise stuff. It's another way of saying, here's my conclusion, so to speak. Here is what my argument is. Try and write that ending. Because getting into something is hard for a lot of people. So what a lot of times what you can do uh, in terms of getting into something is just simply start. Uh, now, uh, some of those uh, overcoming blocks uh, techniques is uh, uh, one professor who was a journalist. Uh, so writing was OK. He likes to write in his office. A lot of professors don't like to write in their office. That's where they meet students. They, 
they uh, write at home, you know, office at home. But he goes to his office, and he's going to write, and he looks out the window, and he writes a description about what's going on out the window. That gets him cooking. That, that warms him up. Uh, and oh, there's that kid with her, her bike again, locking it up, you know, wore the same clothes for three days. Something must be going on there. So, must be finals coming. So, uh, 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 you know, and writes a commentary, and that gets him going. So, a lot of people do the free writing, you know, uh, free writing about the topic, free writing about anything. Paula E. Brown gets up in the morning and she writes in a notebook by hand. Uh, and writes it, and then puts it in a, uh, a way. She's got boxes and boxes of these every morning doing writing. Um, and that gets her going. Uh, I discovered several students uh, who have done this, and a professor does this. I discovered first of a student in Latin American studies who's doing stuff about textiles and villages in Guatemala. Um, uh, you know, that they mean different things for each village, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, so she said, well, what she does is that she sits down at her com computer, she's writing a thesis for Latin American studies, and she starts writing a whole bunch of, you know, she curses out her project, Stanford, her professor, you know, a whole bunch of obscenities, you know, God damn, I hate the farmer. In Guatemala, the different textiles, she would slip into writing her thesis. And I, 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 I kind of talked with her some to try and figure this out. And what it amounts to is that she would ride her anxiety, you know. She would get pumped with adrenaline, right? You know, all these forbidden things, letting it out, you know. Like, and then that would get her into writing the thing. I don't know if any of you have done this. You should try it, but also be aware of delete. You don't want to, it could be one of the great disasters of your life to hand in that, that paper. So, you know, uh, uh, that's another one. Then that's the other thing in terms of adrenaline. I know it's a little bit off from what you asked, but, but it made me think of this, is that how many of you wait to the last minute to write? All right. For some people, it, uh, uh, it's like don't write until you see the whites of their eyes. You know what I mean? Until it's, it's all figured out. But for a lot of people, it, it, it's uh, it's the f fear that gets you going. It's the adrenaline of staying up all night. You know, you know, pray that you stay young because it ain't gonna be so easy 10, 15, 20 years from now to be able to do that. And you know, you get pumped up with that adrenaline. Now, there are some people who cannot do that. They have to write it the day before or two days before. Any of you like that? Right, OK. Because you get choked. If you get that last minute thing, that adrenaline might choke you from thinking anything. Your head goes bzzz, right? Of course, as college students, you're always doing it you know, for that deadline, right? Uh, and you know, life is like that. What can you say? But um, it's that adrenaline that pumps into you. So the thing in order to sustain writing is that you've got to figure out ways to get some kind of little jolt going before the deadline. Uh, sometimes it's to make a little goal. I'm going to write uh, you know, until this section is done by this date. I would have students come to me because they're writing long projects say, look, and, and to professors say, I'm going to hand in that chapter on Friday. And the professor would say, I'm not going to be able to read it. I'm going away. You know, you can hand it in on Monday. No, I have to hand it in on Friday. Otherwise, I won't get it done. And I got other things I got done. I got to go ahead. Hey, don't you know? Just hand it in. You know, I'll read it when I can. Uh, type of thing. So that's another. Uh, you know, this thing of of that adrenaline and that fear uh, uh, is another uh, kind of factor. The other thing. And now, all of you in writing classes here, I am sure, have gone through this is that you have to let yourself write. That means you have to let yourself write crap, OK? I always tell students to put a little sign over their computer or wherever they work that says, crap is good. <laughs> uh, and you know, this is a lot of writing books. You know, I've talked about the shitty first draft and all this kind of thing. You have to write in order to get something to work with. You have to meander. 
in order to then look at it and make an outline of what is it you did and the, the discover. If you think it, think it, think it, think it, it may not get worked out. Because a lot of times you can only figure out what you want to say by trying to say it, by writing it. Uh, some people want to figure it out in advance, and if they can, that's good. But even when they write it, it's going to change somewhat. So uh, you know, that's a, 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 another kind of reality, the draft. And some of you may be assigned, you have to write a draft and show the draft or whatever it might be, and that's good. But the reality is that you always have to have a draft and you have to accept that it's going to be crappy. This is hard for a lot of people. Perfectionism is a real danger. You want to write excellent stuff, but perfectionism is the expectation that you're going to sit down and it's going to be brilliant. That's it. I don't need to do a more, OK, I'll go through and check the spelling, you know, whatever. But I'm done. I've got it, right? Sometimes that happens. I wouldn't you know, say that that couldn't happen. But most of the time, you, you don't know that. You have to go through the loops of revision and revision and revision and figure and show it to a friend, read it out loud to yourself, all these different things that you might do to try and understand what it is that that what needs to be done to, to make it clearer, to uh, make it sharper, whatever it might be. You know, so this is something that you need to accept. I had one student, she was writing about the history of dance, you know, modern dance, and uh, three chor choreographers. Terrific project for uh, uh, humanities program. And uh, she was a perfectionist. She could not produce. Uh, and then talking with her, uh, what I realized is, uh, we both realized is that she needed a boss uh, and a deadline. So I had a large enough office with a, a table in it. And I said, OK, you're working Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 10 to noon and 2 to 4. Here, I'm your boss. You come in and work three days a week at those hours. And you're supposed to produce five pages each day, but I will not accept them unless it's crap. OK? Uh, so she did that for three days. And the boss got inside her head. She didn't need an exterior boss anymore. She was able to motivate herself that way. And she was able to continue. She still didn't finish by the time of graduation. And I met her parents at graduation. They said, well, she's got 65 pages. It really looks good. I said, at a certain point, watch what she's doing and then grab it and send it in because she'll never finish. Uh, because it won't ever be perfect. So, uh, you know, so it's a real problem to have that kind of thing. That's another way that you block yourself, that you want to have things that are, that are immediately perfect. Um, so, uh, let's see, any other questions? I kind of meandered off into the different things. I find a lot of space in the writing that. <clears throat> It's hard for me to pick an argument, stick with an argument, because I've always found myself to be fairly open enough to listen to someone else's idea, which then sends me into, you know, this mild to the yeah. of which direction do I really do I really see it in the way that I want to go, or how do I stick with that argument if I really do see another side to it? Right. Well, um, so. A lot of times, for example, uh, literature professors don't want you to read essays about whatever it is that you're, you know, uh, uh, The Great Gatsby. Just read the book and figure out what your interpretation is. Because what ends up happening is that someone reads an essay and says, oh, that sounds right. That's a, and then you read the next one and says, oh, that's a good interpretation. You know, you, you get swayed and then you end up writing an anthology, so to speak, of everyone else's interpretations. Um, and not your interpretation, which could be identical or similar to someone else's. So, uh, the thing I think to do is to accept what's going on, at least initially as part of the drafting process, that uh, you're, you are anticipating the counter arguments and a lot of them you find appealing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the question is, why did you have your original argument? There must be something appealing about that and if there's something appealing about a counter argument, uh, does that overturn your argument, your original argument, or do, does that actually expand your argument? Do you actually take it in and say, okay, well, this is yet another thing? Is there a way that you can 
you bracket something off and say, well, there are these other things going on, but I'm going to focus on just this, which is, sustains my argument. Uh, so those are some of the techniques. But I think the thing is, um, is to accept it initially and go with it as far as you can. And then see where that takes you. Because in the end, you might end up seriously changing your argument. Oh, I think that often. often, right? I find myself going to another subject because I can't get past, or you know, another topic because I can't get past. You can't get past yeah. the, the block of that other right. argument. Well, maybe you should switch the argument and argue the counter argument <laughs> <laughs> in a way. And then see whether or not your original argument actually undermines the, that counter argument. Right? Uh, there are different ways uh, of, of doing that. But w what you're describing is a problem that is really not a problem. It's, it's, a, it's part of your creative process. And that's good. You just have to take it as far as you can. And you might have to allow yourself more time. You have to kind of take it all the way and then see where, where you are in that. Now, you know, if you end up having to write a, a, an article about your uh, against abortion, and at the end of it, you're for, you know, ch a choice. You know, that would be a radical switch in point of view. Although that is one of the most polarizing issues we have today, there are compelling arguments for at least being, uh, you know, having empathy for the for people who hold different views and why they may have those point of view and what exactly is it. So there are ways that you kind of open up and that would be again another kind of counter argument that you really want to absorb uh, into what you're doing. It's uh, empathy uh, that that would be like writing the counter you know, writing as if you're somebody else. Okay? You know, uh, uh, write you, you voted for Obama, write that you're going to write, uh, you're going to vote for, um, you know, uh, uh, who's running? I don't know. You know, the big hair. You're going to vote for big hair, right? Uh, 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 and here's why, right? Something that you maybe don't feel, but you want to exercise what that could be. Um, other, other, uh, yeah. Oh, what was it like to have writing as a job? Because you, you, you uh, talked about writing for the, the fire departments. Mm -hmm. what, what's that like? Is that considered technical writing? or? What? Well, uh, some of it was technical writing. Uh -huh. uh, technical writing is, you know, well, you know, when you, uh, you open up, you get the computer manual. instruction manual. Some of the instruction manuals will be do this, do that, do this, do this. Very problematic sometimes when it comes from another country and they haven't figured out how to explain from here to there, and you got to you know, all that. Uh, that that you know that would be instructional design. That would be educational technology. Um, but you know, I did other kinds of writing. Now I did journalism as well. Journalism about the Middle East conflict. Um, I enjoyed it. A lot of people wouldn't like it. Every time that I uh, did some writing for a job about, let's say, microwave electronics uh, or how to uh, uh, training programs for how to document, you know, millions and millions of dollars of international loans and things of that sort, right? I got into it. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, in terms of my own writer's block, uh, every time I got a new job like that, I've got okay, microwave electronics. If any of you know microwave electronics, it's one of the weirdest electronics around versus digital, which is, you know, ones and zeros. Give me a break, right? Uh, uh, it's really complicated and it's really uh, uh, strange. Okay, so I'm looking, and I work with an engineer. I work with an engineer at HP, and we're going to go, okay. And I'm going, what is this? And, I'm, and I would pass out. I literally pass out and lay down on my floor. And, say, oh. and I would get this incredible fear. Again, it's that adrenaline fear. How can I do this? I don't know. How can I do this? And then I said, OK, we got to eat. It's a job. We got to eat. Uh, and, and I would get myself into it, force myself to pay attention to it, force myself to start writing whatever it might be and however badly it might be. And the thing about that is that um, I would then get another job and I, I would go get a panic attack. 
again. And what I realized after several of these is that I would always get a panic attack. And now, I, and I still do. And I would go, okay, you're getting the panic attack. Go with it. You know, get panicky. Then you know you're going to then turn around and, and get to work. The panic attack became a part of what I did. The other thing in terms of, of uh, writing in different ways is that uh, I learned to write under all kinds of circumstances because if I had a job in LA and one in San Francisco that I had to go to LA and uh, one hour on a flight and I would write uh -huh. uh, by hand. People didn't bring their laptops on planes at that point. I don't think they were invented yet in the, in the mid 80s. So, you know, that, that sort of thing, right? Under any circumstances, forcing myself to write. And I knew I had reached a certain uh, level in that when I was in Beirut uh, in the midst of this uh, civil war. Uh, and I was at someone's house and I was writing something. And there was uh, artillery explosions uh, a block or two away. And they said, oh, don't worry, it's a block or two away. You know, it's like, we live in Beirut. You know, we know it's over there. Oh, don't worry, uh, gun smoke is coming in. No, they're not after us. Uh, uh, so under those circumstances, I was able then to continue writing. And I said, OK, now I, I got the sense that uh, 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 I've overcome any kind of uh, hesitation about, oh, I need the right atmosphere. I need a glass of wine. You know, kind of thing. And a lot of people do you, I mean, for your best writing. You know, that's another thing, how people work and where they work, right? You know, some people like to go to the library. Some people like to write in a coffee, you know, coffee shop with a lot of people around them who they don't know, but that white noise. I, one professor um, uh, likes to write on the train. He commutes from San Francisco to Stanford, and he writes on the train. That means he's got 45 minutes, and ah, then 45 minutes going back. And that's what he does. And, and he's a biologist, and, you know, uh, although he writes things about uh, science, uh, popular uh, for the New Yorker and things like that. So, you know, he's quite a good writer. And I knew one graduate student who wrote her dissertation on the train. She got a pass. She would go back and forth between San Francisco and San Jose writing her dissertation. You know, that kind of nice rocking thing. And, <laughs> and, and, and then she would get off uh, and go to a coffee shop in order to edit, you know, and uh, work on things and get back on the train. So. Uh, that was an interesting environment. A lot of people are not into it. Two minutes? Okay, a couple of minutes. Any more questions? Yeah. I, I see that you do have a biography, and that's something I'm working on right now, and I wonder if you could say a few things about what that process was like and how you kept the focus, how you no. found the important things. Well, it, 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 it's, uh, this is the book. It, it's not exactly a biography, it's an oral testimony. It's running through fire, how I survived the Holocaust. It's the story of my aunt surviving World War II. And I did that with uh, uh, interviewing her. I mean, I've heard her stories in bits and pieces all my life. Um, and, but I wanted to get it from beginning to end. And so uh, I did uh, interviews, and, uh, or just talking with her, and recording 17, 18 hours of tape. Then got it transcribed. Uh, and then went through editing it, okay? Um, and I did it as for research uh, for what ended up being two pages in this book. But it was really interesting, and people said, you ought to make this into a book, so I did make it into a book, okay? Uh, just to keep, uh, finish that, um, it took 25 years for it to come out, okay? And that's a whole other story about publishing and, and writing and being patient about things. It was originally just for my family. Uh, and then, oh, you ought to get published. And I went through a very crazy round of publishers. And then a friend of mine who's a novelist said, oh, you should get this published. And uh, uh, he recommended a publisher who, of course, was going out of business. So uh, uh, it took another round for that to, uh, to happen. And just to go to your question, then somebody one of the uh, uh, crazy responses I got from publishers says, this is a terrific story. This is like a novel. It needs more ca character development. <laughs> it's not a novel. 
she's a great storyteller, but she's not going to have character development when she talks about you know, someone who's torturing her or something like that. So uh, it, uh, it, it's not going to work in that kind of way. Um, the other thing, because I had her and she stayed alive through those 25 years, uh, um, I could talk with her more and find out more detail, more information. And when it was finally going to be published, there was a lot more that came out. It was very difficult. You know, she lived on Svinushki Street and had to escape on Svinushki. P Street, something like that. You know what I mean? It's like the names were, were very uh, 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 difficult in that way. And even great parts of the story. She ran away with a guy that made believe they were married. They weren't. He was a common criminal in her eyes. But they ran away together. And after the war, she was in Paris. He comes knocking on the door. Take me to America with you. And she doesn't know how he found her. Uh, so it was quite a remarkable story. An incredible Hollywood story, in fact. You know, the guy comes, you know, after she fights him off all the time because he wants to consummate the wedding. So, uh, uh, and uh, she just remembers that at the, at the last minute. So, getting memories from her was the problem, you know, thing. The other thing is, um, uh, one of the people, um, and I think it's on the site. Um, uh, Arnold Rampersad is a professor who just retired who wrote a biography of Ralph Ellison. Uh, he wrote a lot of biographies of uh, Jackie Robinson. Uh, he worked with Arthur Ashe, the great tennis player, uh, who uh, uh, he worked with him on his autobiography. So biography was his thing. But the thing that he discovered in working on Ralph Ellison, who wrote The Invisible Man, uh, and then essays and an unfinished second novel, is that he grew to like him less and less. He didn't like him, OK, for various different reasons. Some of it was personal, because he met him. He was not very supportive of other black writers, young black writers coming up. And one of them was him. They tossed him up. But as he read more and more, the letters, you know, uh, higher gossip, as he called it, you know, reading someone's letters and all this stuff. And he had to restrain himself from turning it into why I hate Ralph Ellison uh, book, and, and a, really a biography of, uh, of that. With biography, you have a, a chronology set before you. And you know, uh, uh, not that that's automatically the way it goes, but you, you have something. And then why are you writing a biography? There's some main accomplishment or main theme somebody has in their lives. Um, so you know, those are some of the uh, uh, ways that you stay on track. I guess the main thing is, why is this person interesting? A lot of times it's what they accomplished. And it may be what they accomplished despite themselves, you know, or whatever it might be. There's some kind of development tension that goes on there that you learn in the, in the process. Huh? Hollis, done? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.